go. And then what I'm gonna do, we just gonna, I'm gonna keep the sound too, in case you have any problems. And once we start on the Instagram, then we re remove the sound of the computer. So, okay. My best. Okay. I mean, you, need, you need a technician. I am the technician it's, for everyone. He's a technical <laughs> advisor also. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. I need a technical advisor. Anyway. Okay, live. We go. Oops. Oh, there we go. So now I will try and check. Okay, I don't know why it's not. You see? Ah, because I didn't turn the camera. Okay, can you see me? Paul? Send a request to be in Annie Nero's live video. Okay. So I should... I'm sending a request now. Okay. okay. There you go. I see okay, you. So let me move the, the sound here on the computer. Okay, so Paul should join in a second. Guys, remember that we are recording this one and we will put it on, on YouTube later on. Hopefully with the Headphones is a little bit less noisy than last time. Okay, saying that you're connecting. And remember, if you want to ask any question in Spanish, uh, go and do it, and then I will translate. And I will translate the answer too. Okay. My Instagram, my, let me see. Some connection problem. I don't see you. And I... Do you have a problem with the Wi Fi? No. Sorry, guys. I'm just uh, speaking with Paul via Zoom, so I know he's there, but if not, he's having some problems with. I can't see. Okay. Can you see me? Uh, not yet. No. Have you request send another request? I can try. Because it was saying connection, connecting. Yeah. Sorry guys, we'll make it work in a second. Okay. Yeah, okay. Now I have, I've added you. Okay, the question, one question, if I can provide you it. Ah, here you are. Okay. That's okay, fine. perfect. Welcome. So Dr. Freeman, uh, who is a neurology and neurosurgery, a clinician and teacher at Cambridge University. Thank you very much for joining us. And obviously, the author, one of the authors of the book that you are all asking about, which probably that's what we're going to start with, because I know that everyone is, has been asking. So when is the book out? Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me, first of all. And, uh, and thank you also for mentioning the book. Uh, the book should be out in July, We've been, uh, probably the end of July. Um, okay. It should be available to pre-order. And uh, now, uh, anytime soon, from Wiley.com. So guys, we will add, I will add at the end all the links, but you can pre-order the book. And I think that what is most important, because I have all the time a message about what book could you recommend as a neurology practitioner? So what, yeah, so who will be the buyers of the book? Who is this book directed to? Yeah, so we wrote this book really with uh, general practitioners in mind, mainly. Uh, GP vets, uh, maybe final year students also could find it uh, helpful, I hope. The, the idea came from um, some talks which we gave uh, a few years ago um, at BSAVA in uh, England. Uh, and I gave a couple of talks then which were really aimed at general practitioners trying to uh, help GP vets to understand neurology better, to understand how to approach neurological cases, uh, to take away the fear of neurology. Um, yeah. Talks went uh, 
fairly well, and so we decided maybe this was something we could turn into a little, a little book. So, uh, it's very simple, uh, I hope, uh, easy to understand, easy to follow. Um, yeah, and I think that also what also today what is going to be about what to do when you don't have all the resources that you would like to have. And remember, guys, that we posted a few months ago the way to do your own CSF cytology at work, and, and Paul was part of the authors of that uh, of that paper. You remember when we put just the the, um, the CSF um, needle, you put it upside down. Um, um, a slide, and well, you can actually explain us how do you do it. Yeah, I can explain. Well, the thing is, uh, I've only been lucky enough to work in this uh, specialist environment in Cambridge for the last uh, three and a half years. Um, before that, I was uh, actually working in a, a general practice, my own practice. So I, I, I'm really a more of a practitioner um, than a specialist, I would say. Um, and so I was in a situation where we were taking CSF, I was doing neurology referrals, and we could not get the CSF analyzed uh, quickly. So we had to send it in the post, and you know sometimes with CSF, it sits in the post, the cells rupture, you don't get a true cell count. So um, I'd heard about methods of creating uh, sedimentation chambers where you, you have to uh, create this little thing with a syringe barrel and, and it to me it was just too complicated and I it's a pain, yeah. I'm also quite uh, lazy um, and I couldn't be with all of that so I decided just to try uh, when we remove the needle after taking the CSF out, and rather than then uh, emptying the contents of the needle into the, uh, the test tube to actually invert the needle stand it upside down on a microscope slide so the hub is down and so it acts like a sedimentation chamber, exactly. And we less left it there for an hour or so, uh, and then we would take it off, we would air dry the slide, we would diff quick stain the slide and have a look. And always we'd send a sample away anyway to the lab, and we gradually began to realize that our results were very accurate. And what we were finding on our slide was representative of the results that happened back in most cases, and sometimes we would find cells and the lab wouldn't find cells because they had disappeared in, yeah. in the yeah. weekend or something like that. So yeah. yeah. And, and you will also use, you will use the Nibauer chamber to do the count like we can do at home? Yeah, to be honest. You didn't even do that. could, but we didn't even do that. We, we, we didn't do a, a cell count. That's the one thing with the technique. You can't really get an accurate cell count. It's much more to give you a differential, to give you a psychology. Because what we found, and what, what you will know, obviously, many of you, is that CSF should not contain white blood cells. The only reason it will contain white blood cells is if there is a problem, or if you accidentally snag a blood vessel and you have some, some blood contamination. But assuming no blood contamination, you should have no white blood cells. So if you find some white blood cells on this sedimentation, yeah, sure. yeah. immediately... You, you know you have some kind of problem and, and really it's to help in those cases where you are suspicious that is this meningitis could it be muo so you're looking for some some specific cells and uh, so really we were much more concerned with the, the cytology the, the differential and whether we found cells or not yeah and later we, on when we when we did the paper we validated it a little bit further and we found that five cells per high field uh, magnification was equivalent more or less to five cells per microliter. Okay, that's perfect because that's exactly what uh, so many people. I mean, I don't know in other countries. I know a lot of vets in Latin America. They have that struggle. They don't know who to sell the cytology. They first of all, it takes too long. Another, it's not that they don't rely on the results, but they, but they kind of a little bit like. Yeah, yeah, not very sure about yeah. the results they're going to have back. Well, so. that's the, the problem. If you get a negative result, you don't know, is it just yeah. because died or, or is it really negative? And this is the problem. Yeah. And then when you have this technique, you need to learn to also have the new results because if you're used to having your CSF sitting for two, three days, and then when you have, exactly. you know, it's it's like, when I have one cell, it's like, oh my God, I have one cell. It's like, yeah. Exactly. Because you just look at the CSF right now. Okay, so um, guys, uh, you can start asking if you see any questions. Let me just make sure that I haven't missed any question. Uh, remember that today's presentation is gonna be about uh, this disease. 
So go ahead about asking any questions. Um, is, um, the general idea is this disease. We want to help you to know what to do when you cannot refer or when surgery is not possible. But if you have any questions about surgery, we'll be happy to answer too. Um, I think that the first question, which is going to be, I, I have actually no idea of your opinion, so I'm very interested. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm sure that a lot of people are thinking. So no surgery is possible. Steroids or no steroids? For me, no steroids. For, uh, for an acute an acute disc, uh, let's say, let's qualify that a little bit and say for an acute uh, Hansen type 1 extrusion, with the way you suspect an extrusion, uh, I think no steroids. There is no evidence uh, for me that steroids make any difference in these cases. Um, I think for a, for a chronic disc, for a type 2 disc, then yes, I, I like some prednisolone in those cases. I think they, they can do well with some low dose prednisolone. And for how long do you do you use it? In the type twos? Mm -hmm. Depending on response to be honest. Um, and depending on, on what the owner really wants to do. I mean now obviously in my situation now uh, most cases surgery would be an option if you wanted to go down that route. And I think you can do better with surgery sometimes. But often they're big dogs, they're older dogs, maybe the owner doesn't really want to put that dog through a big surgery and you know sometimes those dogs get worse after surgery before they get better as well. So this is a big consideration. Um, so I think uh, it, it, for me, you know, I will try them on steroids. If they, will, if they respond well on the steroids, um, then we'll have a discussion with the owner. Uh, because also I think if they respond well to steroids, they probably will respond to decompressive surgery, right? Um, and so we can then have another discussion about whether they want surgery for a, a long-term fix, perhaps, uh, whether they want to just stay on the low-dose steroid, in which case we'll try and wean them down to the lowest effective dose, maybe take them off and see if they can manage without them, but if not, then, then go back on. And will you start, do you use like 0.5, 1 milligram? What would be your... Yeah, you know, probably, probably I would probably start with 0.5 twice a day, so it's a nitpicky per day, um, just for the first couple of weeks, and then try and come down to 0.5 per day or less. Yeah, I, I'm a little bit against steroids in general, but I agree mm -hmm. that um, in a lot of the chronic cases, uh, they do work. Um, mm -hmm. And I completely agree that these heavy dogs, particularly with people that they are not involved, doesn't matter how many times you explain them that the dog is going to be worse after surgery and it's going to take a while to work again. Uh, some people, they just give up and then you have uh, a very unhappy owner because it doesn't matter how much you explain it, they're not happy. And, and it can be difficult these days. You need to do a lot of times like a corpectomy to really get, get underneath the disc. Yeah. I also in dogs that you have like many uh, protrusive discs, uh, also it can be very, very difficult. It can be difficult to know which disc to operate, right? Yeah. So we have... Some of these, uh, sorry. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Which one is the, the bad one? Because we yeah. know that there is not a big relation between the compression you see on MRI and... And, uh, and then we could start talking hours and hours about how you interpret your MRI, uh, what sequence of MRI will be used to know if something is more chronic than acute. And I'm looking forward to someone publishing that paper, but I don't think that there is... Yeah. Any imaging? I don't think it's coming anytime soon. No. no, no. Okay, so we have two questions related to CSF that we were talking about, and then we'll come back to the back. I just want to get uh, kind of finish with the CSF. So there was huh. one question in Spanish was saying, what other tests could they do as complementary tests when doing the cytology for CSF to uh, rule out other diseases, which I guess that it will be other infectious diseases. Yes, I mean, you can take some CSF and send for PCR. Obviously, uh, if you have uh, a suspicion of infection, then you know, we, in, in the UK, uh, we don't have a lot of infectious diseases, maybe compared to some other parts of the world. But, you know, we would routinely perhaps test for toxoplasma, uh, neospora, sometimes coronavirus, FIP, uh, if I can say that nowadays. Yeah. Uh, let's call it FIP. And uh, probably that's, that's about as much maybe distemper, but we really rarely see distemper nowadays. Um, so yeah. yeah, probably would be the biggest thing. 
the big problem I think that I, they have in Latin America is that they don't have, again, reliable uh, labs where they can send it. And I always said, why don't yeah. you send it to the States? Because obviously sending a PCR on CSF, that is a very stable sample. You can post it, it can be a few days, a week, like it doesn't matter. Yeah. The DNA is not gonna disappear from your, your EDTA tube. Obviously it's important that you choose correctly your tube. And then, yeah, you can do definitely, it's true that with the distemper PCR and, and in Latin America, they do, this do see quite a lot, but we do, do you usually, um, we routinely send, I will say that before, I will always say PCR on all my CSF. Now I tend to send more serology in blood. And if I do something, I may send the PCR because they are pretty expensive. What is your approach? Yeah, I, I, I would say, Probably, if we can, we would do both if we have a high suspicion of, uh, let's say, toxoplasma. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we would try. Uh, I mean, serology obviously is, is quick and easy and relatively cheap, as you say. Um, but if we're taking PSF, then I think we would probably also send for a PCR. Um, depends okay, on, on, on how we manage the case. Really. On, your, on your routine, for example, you have an idiopathic epileptic suspected, like a normal yeah. MRI, you don't send any, no. any infectious. So I, I guess yeah. that also a little bit the question also how we manage these suspicions or not. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I mean, you know, for us, and this is a little bit, again, uh, going back to the book, what, I, what I've tried to do or we've tried to do with this book is to enable people to, to sort of work through a case and come up with a list of, of meaningful differentials. So, uh, you know, you can start with a, with a list of, of you know, say, you know, 20 differentials for a, a, a symptom or a disease but if you work through the process properly obviously you will know you, you can end up with with just one two three things that actually make sense for your case yeah. that the case presents and so you know i always try to teach an approach that that where people have to justify their testing yes yeah. so words i'm not really i've never really been a big fan of just testing everything in every case um, and that's partly be, probably because of my background where, you know, you have to justify uh, every pound that you spend or every dollar that you spend or every euro that you spend. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and so you have to choose your test appropriately. And, yeah. and that's how I prefer to work. To do. Yeah. And that's what we've been always kind of trying to also teach here that we say your neurological exam only tells you your anatomical localization, but it's your clinical history with your epidemiology and clinical progression that is going to give you your three vitamin D. If you don't have your top three vitamin D, you cannot interpret their test. You cannot choose which test you're going to do. So then you have your localization, top three differential diagnosis, and then you're going to choose your test and then you're going to interpret because again, you're going to find a lot of incidental findings on your also diagnostic test and how you interpret that. Um, exactly, exactly. So I will say that for the infectious disease, uh, I'm, I guess that your approach will be the same. If we have an inflammatory disease of the brain, we will send infectious tests. If our top differential diagnosis is an idiopathic epilepsy, um, it's true that here at TAPS, because also we have residents, we tend to do a lot of CSF, and I'm sure that you're the same for the residents to get trained but then we don't tend to send infectious disease. At least the dog is coming from a part of the country that there is a high risk of uh, certain infectious disease and we have a little bit of a different presentation. Yeah, so another question was a PANDI test for the CSF and I, I needed to look it up. I, I knew, but I completely forgot what the PANDI test it's for was. Protein, for right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. From protein. Yeah, I yeah, I actually saw the question come up, and I was thinking, oh my god, I'm not sure I can remember what the handy test is for. And yeah, I have to say, we don't do it in, in that way. Um, we just rely on the uh, to give us the protein level. Um, yeah, and and I know that yeah. some people also use the urine strip to do the protein level, just to know yeah. if it's increased or 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 normal. Um, yeah. To be fair. What is much more important is to know what cells do you have on your CSF more than the increased protein. It's true that you can have increased protein in a traumatic event without uh, increased cells, but yeah, it's not going to tell you much about the disease. Okay, so other question um, from my friend Guido. It's appropriate to immobilize the spine, cast, or another synthetic material, I guess, uh, regarding having this disease, which is a very good question. 
because yeah. I do see a lot of people doing that, and I think that is good that okay. we address that. Yeah. Okay. So it's not something I've ever done for a disc um, to immobilize the spine. I think it, it's it's part of the the debate around cage resting, I guess. So you know, if we see a dog with a, with an acute disc and, and we're not going to be able to take that dog to surgery, then you know, the first thing that I think most neurologists would, would advise would be to immobilize the dog by uh, restricting him to a cage, to a small uh, environment where he cannot move around too much. Now, the reason for that, um, I think, um, and you can correct me if you're wrong, if you think I'm wrong, Annie, but the, the main reason for that is to prevent any further material from yes. extruding from the disc, right? Yeah. So we have this disc, which is basically popped, so there's a hole in the annulus, and there's some calcified nucleus which is leaked out, which is extruded out. Maybe it's exploded out under, under some pressure, um, and it's caused damage. And we're presented with this dog, and the most important thing we can we can do in the first instance is to try to uh, limit the damage and try and stop any more nucleus escaping through that hole in the, the annulus, through the tear in the annulus. And so we recommend cage rest for a period of time. And that's an interesting question in itself: is how long do we recommend cage rest for? Um, but I think you know, for me certainly, that first week after the incident is is really important because. Most of the dogs that are going to deteriorate will deteriorate within the first yeah. week after the, the initial extrusion, I think. So that first week is really important. How long you go on for after that depends on how brave you are, maybe, um, or how cautious you are, should I say. Um, I've, never, I've never tried immobilizing a spine. Now, you know, the only time we would, I would immobilize a spine with a splint or a cast would be uh, if I had a fracture. Um, and if I had a fracture, which uh, I couldn't manage surgically, then I've certainly managed those with, with splints um, in the past. But I have to say, anywhere other than probably the upper cervical spine is very difficult to manage with a splint or a cast, I think. Um, I think you know, we tend to fall back more on cage confinement, even for those uh, fracture cases in the, in the lumbar region particularly. Uh, they're really difficult to, to immobilize with splints, I think. So I, I wouldn't be a fan of trying that for a disc. Yeah, and I think that also, um, um, I, I also look, like, follow a lot, like, recommendation in humans about actually neuromuscular diseases, for example, myasthenia, polymyositis, and you see a lot of trends in humans, not only on fractures, because that I think that there is a trend, they don't immobilize you completely. You don't stay in bed with your leg completely, uh, without moving it. And even with neuromuscular disease that create muscle weakness, the trend is you need to move a little bit. So cage rest for sure, you need to have that annulus to um, kind of close down again. But um, you, yeah, having a cast, I think that it would be a difficult and possible complications. Yeah. I don't know. I also think about like the muscle loss, which to be fair, that is just my idea. I don't know how true it is when you, you know, when you also, we have these cases of these atlantoaxial luxation, you know, tiny dogs, mm. owners don't have any money. The dog is like literally going to do internal decapitation. I'm, I really don't like this cast. You put the cast and it's just, it's a mess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Even, even with the atlantoaxials, I've found it's much better just to have a kind of soft uh, collar on the neck. It's just to prevent them doing yes. this. Yes, yeah, and <laughs> they all. can build up a little bit of, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then for one thing, I know there is another question there, but I think for me something that another important question, and I see when we speak with the students that there's a lot of confusion about this. What hmm. will be for you a successful medical treatment? When will you say this dog is a dog that is work that is responding well, so this dog does not need surgery? Uh, for me, it's to see an improvement neurologically, um, to see a consistent and sustained improvement, um, and also to see the pain being controlled. Because I think one of the big things with these cases, and, and one of the things which sometimes does cause me to take these dogs to surgery, is that the pain persists. You know, and sometimes you find these dogs have a big, hard, uh, chronic extrusion, and uh, you can control them, and neurologically they improve. 
um, they're walking fine maybe, but they're, every time they come, up, come off uh, analgesics, they're in pain and they're in quite significant pain and owners can tell. Um, and you bring them back and you put them on pain relief again and you rest them a bit longer and then they're okay for a while and then the pain comes back. And, and it's not until you take that big chronic bulging extruded away that the pain resolves. So, so I think good, good resolution of pain is, is one thing. Um, but also, yeah, I expect to see um, uh, neurological improvements. So, you know, I want these dogs to be ambulatory. Um, you know, maybe they're not going to be quite as perfect as uh, some of our surgical dogs, but then not all our surgical dogs end up perfect, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, as long, for me, it's about having a functioning pet for most people. And so if the dog can exercise, can take his, his you know, reasonable amount of exercise. He's, he's not too atastic, not too perfect. Um, no, I, mean, yeah, I can cope with a little bit of, of neurological dysfunction if he can still be a, a functioning pain, I think. No? Yeah, yeah, no, I think that the pain is, um, it is, a, is a very big point. And I would like to say also, because I guess that depends also what is acceptable medically can, if you can or if you cannot do surgery. If you cannot do surgery, anything yeah. is acceptable, obviously. Yeah. Um, but Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. If, if, if surgery is an option, then you've got to base your outcome on you know, what you think you could have achieved with surgery. You, yeah. want, you want it to be as good as possible. If surgery is an option, if you're advising, uh, if you're advising somebody to stick with medical management, um, yeah. then we want the outcome to be as good as it would have been if we'd have taken them to surgery. Yeah. But you I, I think there's a there's also a question around the whole and I and I I'm, I'm starting I feel like I'm starting to get a reputation for being somebody that doesn't operate at risks, that advocates medical management for everything which is really not true my you know my background is really a surgeon um, I, I, I'm an orthopedic surgeon originally so yeah, I do like cutting things I have to be honest and it's, really, it's the most satisfying surgery in the world right the the extrusion and um, anatomy. Um, a paralyzed dog that walks after surgery, everybody's happy, the owner loves you. Yeah. Uh, great. But, um, but, you know, I do think that there are still a lot of questions unanswered about these dogs that will take surgery. And I do honestly feel that we, we operate too many dogs because we're afraid not to operate them. And it would be nice. And, and my, my goal over the next few years is to try to establish some better guidelines for, for hopefully or whatever, uh, you know, for, for which dogs really would benefit from surgery and which dogs actually would do just as well without surgery. Because we also take some dogs to surgery and we come out after uh, being in theatre and we, we're really thinking, did we really do anything right? Did we, did we really achieve very much there with that operation? Um, uh, and I do, sometimes you come out, you've, you've removed a little bit of soft disc material and some blood, but not very much. And, you know, those cases... I'm sure they would be just as well if we just left yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Um, so, yeah. would be would be nice to know. I, I, I think, and, and that's what I'm, you know, what, what I'm really interested in. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think that is a very good point because also we tend to kind of a little bit at least here because of the uh, we we have the the power to do it. So we have a dog that is non-ambulatory, mm -hmm. and I had actually recently through this coronavirus situation, I had a a dachshund that. Um, he already had three surgeries. So he's five year old, typical Daxon, three yeah. surgeries. And then uh, owners contact me, panic again, he's in pain, he's a toxic. And if he would have been in another situation, he would have come in, the owners were freaking out, he would have had an MRI and probably he would have had a fourth surgery. He had one neck and two backs. And actually he did really well. Yeah. And he didn't have any NSAIDs and he only had gabapentin. So I completely agree. Yeah. And we have, especially Daxons, for me, I always think, oh my God, they have such a huge disc. And how yeah. many, you do the MRI and you find four chronic huge discs. Yeah. I have already seen even Daxons that they had a surgery on the wrong space. Yeah. And they did much better after still surgery. Get better. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. then you see the huge, yeah. 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 And, 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 but the thing, you know, the other thing that worries me about this is, is you know, uh, for many people, certainly in the UK, they rely on uh, insurance to have their MRI and surgery. Yes. And so they maybe have an insurance policy which will give them enough money to have one surgery. So if, if this little Dachshund comes in on his first episode of disc disease at two years old or whatever, 
he has his surgery and then for the rest of his life they have not enough money to do another surgery maybe if at that first surgery he could have got better without surgery they save their money for, for yeah. when perhaps he really needs the surgery and so you know because recurrence is a big thing right i mean they a lot of these dogs have, have second and third even obviously sometimes fourth episodes so, you know it, it, this is a, another reason uh, for me i think that um, it would be nice to, to be able to be more certain yeah, that's a big point. I usually, we, any dog that is ambulatory, we will try medical management first. When they are non-ambulatory, that's when um, we tend to send them to imaging, but... Yeah, it's the same for us. I mean, this is, a, again, you know, ambulatory, medical, non-ambulatory, surgical is a kind of a, a rule that we, we sort of apply, but, you know, without... Maybe we are wrong, yeah evidence for it yeah exactly uh, some of those non-ambulatory dogs certainly most of the spinal cord injury is contusion and uh, yeah yeah severe ones you know the, the, the and so um, uh, yeah, it's yeah. Just contusion then surgery is not going to make much difference which it brings back to the situation of like uh, don't believe guys that a dog with no deep pain only has five percent of chances uh, we have all the primary and secondary cascade that happen after the trauma. And um, there's a lot of things. The only thing you can do is decompress. The second ca secondary cascade, there's not much you can do. That's why you can get also ascending malamalacia. But you need to give it a try. If you can do surgery and not the pain, though, you need to go for it. Don't, don't think that because it's 48 hours, then that's it. It's gone and he will never recover again. And I think that we also started to see even some fractures with not the pain more and more. Okay, let's go to, yeah, 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 what is scary. Okay, let's question. So difference between, um, so hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion and FCE on MRI and clinical presentation. That's a, another one hour lecture, but we can, there's, there are, there's a very good paper, so there's few. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, I think that the first thing to say, the hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion is, is maybe easier to recognize on MRI because these are the ones that have a bit of compression. This is the seagull, the white disc, the, the, the seagull uh, disc. So, so I think what probably the question is more concerning the ANNPE, right? Non-compressive nucleus pulposus extrusion, yeah. um, where you have a hydrated and, and a non-degenerate disc which um, extrudes uh, and, and causes you an acute onset, per acute onset of, of signs which um, uh, will resolve with medical management. So my first answer would be, uh, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, what, what, I, I don't really care whether it's an FCE or an ANNPE in terms of uh, my clinical clinician head because I'm going to manage them both the same. Um, you know, those dogs for me, they're, they're going to respond um, to, uh, to just basic rehabilitation. Um, they don't usually even need much in the way of, of medical management in terms of relief because they're mostly free within 24 hours. Um, so it's really about rehab for those dogs. And, and uh, uh, so I, I'm not hugely fussed whether it's an FCE or an ANNPE. Um, there are some people uh, who I think have the opinion that maybe they're the same thing anyway. Um, but yeah. maybe, maybe, I don't know. But it, it, you know, there, there's a big crossover in the clinical presentation, in the MRI appearance. Um, I, I wouldn't get hung up about it personally. Yeah. I wonder. Um, Sometimes, yeah, sometimes see, you are super lucky that you see like a tiny piece of disc in the, in the space. Sometimes no, yeah, at, yeah. at all. Yeah, and I was, sometimes, you know, yeah, you imagine the nucleus pulposus size and you yeah. can say, well, you know, it's lost a bit of nucleus pulposus, so it's an ANNPE. It's right over the disc space, so it's an ANNPE. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, but these things are a little bit unclear. Yeah, and then again, the, the, what you would do will be different. Some people say that for the extrusions, the dog may be on a little bit more discomfort and maybe need a little bit more pain relief that for an FCE than not. Question will be, for example, on my log myelogram that probably uh, a lot of you are still doing. I think that probably the findings on the myelogram will be, will be the same. If there is a lot of yeah. edema of the spine, you will see like a big area where there is no contrast. But uh, if the, yeah. the, the the amount of this that you have, it will be so small that you wouldn't see really a compression, a deviation of the of the no. column. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. And I, I wonder what an HNPE, the the white disc, would look like on the monitor. To be honest, maybe the maybe the 
uh, Omnipake, the, the contrast medium, takes would, it. would take it away anyway. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, it would. <laughs> it would be interesting to know. <laughs> if you fire it in from a lumbar puncture, maybe you can actually force that material away with your myelogram. How about that? Yeah, yeah. For HNPE. That uh, maybe we should publish a <laughs> paper about myelogram. And, um, there was actually a paper. They, there was an Italian group that they published paper of vascular myelopathy, a myelogram versus MRI. So they took a myelogram and they did an MRI. Mm. Uh, and they, they were saying at the end of the day they were very confident that they could really recognize there was a non-compressive lesion with the myelogram. So they mm. have got a lot of cases. Okay. So then someone is asking about, a, I'm a little bit confused because it's, it's a question in Spanish. It's an opinion about mannitol or SSH, which I will say that is a hypertonic salina, sí, solución salina hypertonica. So a hypertonic solution, but then EDIV extreme. That's a bit confused because I don't think, Jose, eh, me puedes decir que quieres decir por ED y V, ¿te refieres a utilizar manitol y, y solución hipersalina, solución hipertónica en discos o en patologías craneales? ¿Te importa decirme? Porque estoy un poquito perdida con eso. Ok, so let's see if he tell us. Ok, okay another question. Patients with this extrusion, with chronic pain, can this pain can be caused by the arthrosis of the, of the articulation due to instability? Can we help that with the infiltration? Echo uh, that's a that's an interesting theory. I think you know most of our disc extrusions occur uh, without abscess, where there's no significant arthropathy uh, or no no instability. Apparently, no sign of of uh, uh, joint um, problems. So, I would say that pain probably can't be managed by local infiltration. Um, I think the pain comes from uh, inflammation and uh, stretching of the meninges or the local spinal nerve root by the extruded material and you know with those dogs generally in my experience once you go in and remove that material the pain goes away very quickly right 48 hours you know these dogs are, are looking and feeling better um, so I think it's a it's a fairly quick uh, response to that where you know if it was anything to do with an arthropathy in the joint then uh, operating would, would potentially make things worse rather than better. So I, I, I don't think that's very likely. Um, and then with people, maybe the, the idea of injecting the disc. Yeah. I think that that's doing in people, and maybe that's where it's coming from. Um, yeah, I think so. But I think with with people, you know, it's well recognised that you can have disc genetic pain, so you can have pain associated with a disc potentially under pressure or a degenerate disc, and actually. And infiltrating that disc uh, certainly gives you diagnostic information and potentially uh, can, can help as well. Um, and then there's the, the epidural uh, steroid injection, which we do at the lumbar sacral region sometimes, which again is something quite popular or has been quite popular in people um, as a way of, of relieving pain associated with the inflammation that comes from sometimes a, a chronic disc extrusion. But in people, you know, most of their extrusions have a much more chronic nature than ours. Um, they are extrusions, but they behave more like our canine protrusions. Uh, so the, the pain tends to come from stretching of nerve roots, compression of nerve roots, inflammation around the uh, uh, squashed nerve root, rather than the sort of acute explosive extrusion that, that we have in the chondrodystrophic dogs particularly. Yeah, and I think that is a very good question also to talk about because I see I know that some, um, some uh, colleagues, they have um, trained uh, in other countries with human neurosurgeons. And mm -hmm. I can see a lot of uh, people doing uh, veterinary neurology, which do a lot of stabilizations after doing a mm -hmm. one level hemilaminectomy. And I think yeah. that that's something that we need to really be talk about because we are different mm -hmm. animals. And it's true that in humans, they do have a little bit more like arthrodesis, well, after this, so stabilization, putting a lot of plates. And, and we do have a different approach. And I think that is very important yes. what you explain about how is the pathology of the human disc, which is mm. more like a fibroid degeneration, is what we will have this kind of more protrusive type of disc. Yes. But yeah, it is a different approach. And we don't need to do a, a vertebral stabilization after doing a no. one level or two level hemilaminectomies. 
in three maybe. Even three maybe, yeah. I was always taught you can do three consecutive hemilaminectomies. If you, if you need to, uh, I mean, I don't think many people probably would do that anymore. We would maybe favor a mini hemilaminectomy yeah. if we were to do something so extensive. Yeah. Um, but certainly, uh, certainly I was taught that, you know, three, three spaces consecutively on one side would not significantly destabilize the spine. And I have to say, I have done it before. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I was publishing recently about ventral slot, which we know that two space on ventral slot, easy, no problem. There's been some report of through, obviously not consecutive, like three slots and it's fine. So you don't need to have, uh, you don't need to worry guys about the stability when you do hemilaminectomy. And, um, and yeah, the type of, we're talking about this extrusion. I think that is different if you're doing a disc protrusion when, for example, you're going to do a hemilaminectomy, a corpectomy, because then you are affecting two levels of your vertebra. And a corpectomy, remember that also going through the disc, that is really unstable. So removing the disc and the vertebral body that is much more unstable that remove the pedicle or the, or the articular process. So I think that that's... Okay, so the other question, yeah, indeed was for the manitol or the hypertonic sol uh, solution <laughs> for the uh, intervertebral disc disease. Okay, that's another thing I've never, never used, uh, I have to say, for, uh, I guess you're talking about potential therapy for the acute intrusive injury where you're going to have some of that um, edema associated with it, but I've, I've never, I've never read a report, I've never seen um, that uh, used, I have to say, either manitol or hypertonic. I mean, I have raised intracranial pressure in the brain then, to be honest, I, I, I will use it, I don't mind, to be honest, I mean, yeah. it's a mix between the two, and I think with human neurosurgeons, some people favor one set of people, favor the other. probably it's like a, a lot of things, you're, you're best using the one that you're most familiar with, yeah. um, and, and you'll get the best results from things that you're most familiar with, um, but I never tried it for acute spinal cord injury, I have to say, never yeah, tried I, yeah. you know, my, my feeling with the, what I always teach, again, with acute spinal cord injury, there's a limited amount that you can do in, in the same way as with an acute uh, brain injury. There's a limited amount that you can do that you have under your control. And really, probably the two most important things, I would say, maintaining a good systemic blood pressure um, so that the blood, the blood pressure uh, systemically is enough that the blood will still be able to get into the damaged um, brain and spinal cord tissue. And then the other thing is just maintaining a good oxygen oxygenation level. So, you know, having the animals on fluids, monitoring their blood pressure, um, having some some kind of oxygen therapy potentially. Uh, you know, maybe that helps a little bit. I don't think anybody's really ever tested it in acute spinal cord injury. But no. uh, in terms of in terms of what potentially we can do um, to to improve the outcome, I think they're they're probably where we're at at the moment. Yeah. What I would say, uh, Jose, um, I don't know uh, where do you have that information, but the thing that I would be a little bit, worried, a little bit careful about is that we know um, we use it a lot for uh, intracranial disease. And if you look a little into the literature in humans, um, even when you do monitor, first of all, like you need to follow up your electrolytes very careful. Um, and you need to uh, see what is the, what is the situation in the blood because just do one dose of manitol, one dose of hypertonic may not do anything, although we would not recommend it for a spine disease. When we use it for brain, you need to use it wisely. Um, and there is obviously in humans, it's not just about what dose you're gonna start with, it's how, what is the consequences into, the, into your blood work, which is, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you need to know your ions, how, how they are electrolyzed, how they are responding. Um, other question, what are your opinions, which are perfect uh, question, or, or, or also for uh, Dr. Freeman being one of the authors of the fenestration paper. Um, so what is your opinion <laughs> about fenestration in management of type 1, uh, this degeneration? In management of type 1. Okay, so I think there's two aspects to that. I mean, I think my opinion is 100% that um, fenestration is a, is a good thing to do in terms of trying to reduce recurrence. You know, and this goes back to what I said earlier on about, um, you know, maybe people have one crack of surgery and they have enough money to, to have one procedure done on their dog in its lifetime, maybe. And so if we're gonna do a decompressive surgery for an acute type one disc, if we're gonna do a hemilaminectomy, then I feel that we should 
at least consider doing some prophylactic fenestration of, of some of the discs. Now, whether we do, I mean, I don't, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't very often do six fenestrations at the same time as a hemi. Um, I certainly uh, sometimes do five. You know, I'll go sort of two spaces on each side of the of the affected disc, depending on the location and depending on uh, how, how accessible the discs are, what type of dog it is. You know, little things like how fat the dog is, how big the dog is, whether it's the right side or the left side that you're approaching, these all make a difference to how accessible the discs are for fenestration. And I think a lot of people uh, myself included, actually, still find fenestration sometimes quite a tricky procedure to do. Well, yeah, 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 no, no. And and so you know, it's it's not a simple, straightforward thing to do. Um, but you know, I think there's very good evidence that it does reduce the risk of future extrusion. So I think we should definitely um, consider it. Now, I'm literally in this lockdown period trying to finish off a paper where we, we've been looking for uh, evidence as to whether the MRI appearance of the discs at the time of an extrusion affects the chances of a, of a recurrence. And yeah. we, we think we've got reasonable evidence that if you have a disc that's completely degenerate in the field of, let's say, five discs yeah. at the junction at the time you do an extrusion, there is a significantly higher chance of having a recurrence within the next year or two. And so, you know, I, I would definitely advocate at least fenestrating completely degenerate discs that are around the one you're operating on. Um, and what, what, do you, what do you define as a completely degenerate? So would you evaluate it by MRI, black. lack of signal, completely lack of signal on T2 yeah, on yeah, MRI? Um, yeah. Yeah, what we did when we when we were doing the study for this paper, we 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 just tried to divide the disc between normal, partially degenerate, and completely degenerate. So we didn't go down the, there's a you know the Furman um, grading system of, of sort of five levels of degeneration, which is quite quite complex actually, and and yeah. quite uh, you know uh, I would stress again, I'm relatively simple in my approach to neurology. So we just decided to divide them into completely degenerate, partially degenerate, which has been done in previous papers as well. So we just moved up. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we found, uh, yeah, and so, you know, we found that there was a significant association with having a completely degenerate disc, um, and particularly adjacent to the affected one. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Which is what I expected, to be honest. Uh, you know, I think, I think uh, for a long time, I've been, uh, my, my, um, uh, approach has been to demonstrate degenerate discs on either side of the affected one at least um, and, and sort of work out maybe two, two spaces on either side if they are very degenerate looking on the other one. I don't want to test them. Because the reason also why I ask you that, a lot of people may be watching, maybe they again they do myelograms and they are just using their x-rays. So uh, what about calcify? I think, yeah. Well, I think there's, there was already some evidence that calcified discs are associated with a uh, higher chance of recurrence. So again, you know, if you see a calcified disc adjacent to the one which you think is gone, I would definitely advocate uh, fenestration of that. And, and there was a paper, uh, the paper that showed, you know, a, a, a sort of 10% reduction in recurrence rate by fenestrating six discs. In that paper, again, you know, they advocated penetrating calcified discs, radiologically calcified discs that were adjacent to, to the affected discs. So I think if you see a calcified disc, definitely. If you don't see calcified disc, it doesn't mean it's not degenerate, and that's yeah. the problem. Um, and so, you know, I think if you if it's a reasonable case, and if particularly if you think you're going to have one shot at doing surgery on this dog, then maybe have a try at penetrating at least the ones on each side. Yeah. But remember, guys, our fenestration, just practice a few times in a cadaver first because, um, yeah, it can, be, it can be a little bit tricky. Uh, you can have some bleeding and you can also, well, you can, well no, you can, you can cut some nerve roots also. And depending what you're doing, yeah, you can maybe, cut some <laughs> if it's a thoracic area, you're not to worry about. But if you're doing an alambar, you need to be really, really, and remember that we don't do fenestration on the neck. Okay. Do you? No, but that's an interesting question. Oh. Yeah, because I thought well, that was too unstable. Oh. Well, no, no, no. I don't know because it's 
interesting because I have another uh, another one of my lockdown papers, which is another one that you know okay. I've been uh, has been in, in the pipeline for years. Where we again we've just been looking at recurrence of cervical discs. So yeah. neck discs are are kind of a little bit different, aren't they? Because you know they they tend to present much more with just pain, um, maybe mild neurological deficits, much more often than than severe. But the pain can be really bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we know that those dogs respond very well to uh, ventral slot decompression. Um, and a number of times over the years, I've been asked, especially since writing this stuff about fenestration, I've been asked whether I fenestrate prophylactically fenestrate cervical discs, and, why, and if not, why not? And I have to say, I, I, I don't normally do that. My answer was always that you know the the, the risk of recurrence is, is less in terms of uh, what I mean by that, the risk of a serious recurrence. So yeah. the recurrence rate in the cervical region is still pretty high. And this paper was re that, that I'm, again, we're working on, was to look for the recurrence rate to try and establish a good recurrence rate. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's probably around 30% or so, I would say, 30 to 35%. So a lot of dogs will have a recurrence of at least the clinical signs of a cervical disc. So you could argue that maybe we should consider fenestration, but then when you look back at the papers, where they fenestrated cervical discs, where they did multiple fenestrations as a, as a form of treatment back in the 70s and 80s. And um, you know, some of the outcomes of those uh, series were not great. And certainly I would never advocate fenestrating alone as a, as a treatment method. Yeah. Well, you know, in the lumbar region, I think there's an argument sometimes. Um, but whether we should fenestrate prophylactic in the cervical region, does it make them more unstable? I don't know. I don't know. I thought of that. A mixed bag of evidence, I think. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I, I was just I was just thinking that it would just kind of... Cr I guess that because maybe, maybe you know, when you do the ventral slow, you have such a good access to the disc because on the when you do the thoracic, you don't... I mean, you cannot take too much. Uh, yeah. With the neck... Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it, could, yeah. 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 Maybe could. it could collapse. But uh, okay. So last question: um, Do you recommend castration in Spain in chondrodystrophic dogs that are prone to this disease? Um, I guess Guido, what is the question about? Like, do you, in case this is going to affect their future as having disc, or just to stop these dogs that they are feeding us every day because I want them to keep breathing and bring them. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, there was a there was a paper last year, wasn't there, where they they looking at the the stud, the um, the big questionnaire study of, of this disease in dachshunds, and they showed an association between neutering and having. Ah. Okay. Um, and so, uh, you know, the 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 argument from that paper would be maybe leaving them intact. This is male, actually leaving yeah. males intact. Would, would would maybe be protective against an extrusion. And, you know, and there is some evidence yeah, for yeah, yeah, yeah. diseases now, you know. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, osteosarcoma in Rottweil, I think there was a paper showing um, that, that leaving them intact was protective, essentially. So, you know, it's something to consider. What we found in the, the recurrence paper that we're in the process of writing up at the moment is that actually uh, the majority of our male dogs were entire. So um, it, it, didn't, it certainly didn't appear to be a protective um, element in leaving yeah. um, So I don't know. I, think it's, uh, I, I don't advocate anything specifically. Yeah, I, I know that you say, you, yeah, it rings a bell that I read something. And I don't think that I read it completely. And I was thinking if there could be also a relationship of being castrated and being a little bit more exercising a bit more and muscle condition a little bit better or we know, right? We don't know. Yeah. There's yeah. so many things to go with and what is this. So yeah, until what age? Yeah, we don't, um, yeah, you're asking guys, but we don't really know um, if there is really a protective uh, benefit of uh, leaving the dog uh, castrated or not. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, I have many questions. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anyone... I can talk about discs all night, to be honest. It's, uh, it's my favorite thing, as you can tell. But let's, let's just do the reminder about the book, 
So this is so funny. It's just like being on the late night show, like, okay, so you're here for the promotion. Of <laughs> and then we should have now the link. No, I will, uh, I will, so I'm recording this, um, this uh, video. I'm going to put it on YouTube and then the link on uh, Facebook so you can watch it again. And then I will put up uh, the link to the book again. Uh, so you can pre-order on Wiley and it's going to be, I think that it's on Amazon Canada already and it's going to be available in July. But I think that you should pre-order so then if by the time it's out, you, you have it at home. <laughs> well, they told me as well that uh, they, they, there would be some uh, discount vouchers available via, via the authors. So if anybody really wants to order this book, then if you, if you uh, send me a message, maybe I will have some kind of discount code or something like that. I'm hoping, anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, obviously send him if you're going to buy the book. Don't ask for the code if then uh, it's <laughs> yeah, waiting, on your, <laughs> waiting on your table. And then, yeah. So yeah, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, I'll see you soon uh, for some beers. Yeah. I can't wait. I, so. I can't wait for the British pint. Like I, <laughs> I mean, they have very good IPAs here, but I, I really, I really like Honestly. the warm, <laughs> the warm beer. Which when yeah, I went yeah. from Spain was like, what the hell? But no, I'm really missing this. Like yeah. the pint up to the edge. Yeah, yeah, with a nice head on top. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're gonna be, you're gonna love Essex. <laughs> Well, we, yeah, yeah, I still, uh, yeah. Okay, guys, thank you so much for being there. Uh, see you soon, and I will post the video on uh, YouTube soon, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you so much. That was really fun.